Hello and welcome to today's lesson. Today we're going to be starting our next unit, which is the memory unit, looking at all the ways that our memory works and how we can use it to our advantage, particularly in the study of psychology. Today we're going to start off with the basics of the information processing model of memory and the first two steps of the memory process, which is sensory memory and short-term memory. So let's take a look. The traditional model of memory that we're going to be using when discussing how our memory works is the atkinson schifrin Information Processing Model of Memory, or the three-box model of memory, as we often call it. This includes the structures of how memory works, which is sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory, and it also includes the processes of memory, how we get information in, how we store it, and how we pull it back out which is encoding, storage, and retrieval. So let's go ahead and get started with the first box of the three box model, and that is sensory memory. So this is the first step of the memory process. This is where information comes in from the outside world, and everything that we come into contact with is essentially our sensory memory. Sensory memory was coined by a psychologist by the name of George Sperling. And he found that we have immediate and initial recordings of sensory information into our memory. So if you think about it, say you are walking down a hallway at school. Everybody you see, everything you hear, all of that information is going into your mind and is going into your sensory memory, but you don't remember all of it. If you were to get to the end of the hallway, for example, and someone were to ask you, name every single person you just saw or tell them every single colored shirt you just witnessed. You probably would not be able to answer it even though your eyes actively perceived that information. Sensory memory is very fleeting and it's very short. And the biggest thing to remember with sensory memory is attention. Attention is key. Everything that we come into contact with is part of sensory memory but only the things we pay attention to can we move from sensory to short-term memory. Otherwise, it's going to be forgotten. And the longer the delay of our exposure to sensory memory, the faster forgetting is going to take place. Within sensory memory, we have two different types of memory. We have iconic memory and echoic memory. Iconic memory, you can think of it like icons, right? If you were to click on an icon on a desktop computer, or when you see an icon of something, it is an image. And so sensory memories, iconic memory, are the images that we see. These images that we see, these images that we are exposed to all over the world, we are able to see for just a few tenths of a second. And again, if we don't pay attention to them, then they fade from our memory very, very quickly. The only exception is if you were to have what is known as a photographic memory, or in psychology we refer to that as an eidetic memory, and that is a long iconic memory. Very few people have true eidetic memories, but if you did, you would be able to remember just about everything you've seen. Echoic memory is our memory for our auditory experiences. So think of echoic like echo, right? It's the things that we hear. And this lasts a little bit longer in our memory, about three or four seconds, as opposed to the few tenths of a second that our iconic memory lasts for. The bonus is, if something sounds good, we refer to that as acoustic memory, and that seems to stick in our minds for even longer. So if we were to say here uh, a series of tones that is sing-songy, our attention is alerted to it, and so we're more likely to remember that sound even if it's just in our sensory memory. So that's the first box of the three box model or the Atkinson Schifrin information processing model of memory. Once information comes into our sensory memory and once we choose to pay attention to that information, then we automatically transfer that inf information into our short term memory or the second box. Short term or working memory is what we call this second area of our memory structure. And inside of our short-term memory, we can hold an average of seven items. In psychology, we often refer to this as the seven plus or minus two, because it really varies from individual to individual, but it's somewhere between 
five and nine items of information we can hold at any point in time. Think about it as if a friend were to give you their phone number, but you don't have time to write it down or put it in your phone. What is the only thing you can do in order to remember it? We often have to repeat it, right? And so we repeat it over and over and over again. And without rehearsal, without doing this continuously, eventually, if we don't do anything with those numbers, eventually they're going to fade from our memory and they're going to be forgotten. There are ways to move it into our long-term memory, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But short-term memory is still very fleeting, and it only holds a small amount of information. We have to do something with it in order to move it into our long-term memory. You can keep something in your short-term memory by using what we call maintenance rehearsal, which is again repetition or rote rehearsal, but that is not the most effective way to move things into our long-term memory. How we get information into our long-term memory is through a process called encoding, and we encode things both automatically and we encode things with a degree of effort. And today we're going to take a look at the three ways that we move things into our long-term memory on purpose. So how do we encode? Psychologists look at three major areas of how we encode information into our long-term memory. We encode by meaning, we encode by visualizing, and we encode by mentally organizing. So let's start with meaning. What do we mean when we say we encode by meaning? Encoding by meaning is also referred to as semantic encoding. And semantic just means meaning. So when we encode by semantic encoding, what we're remembering is we're remembering what things are. So for example, you might remember that AP Psychology is a class, that AP Psych equals a class in your schedule. If that is how you remember it, you've encoded it in your memory semantically. So what happens here is oftentimes we remember things in terms of how they relate to us or how they meet what they mean to us, and that's going to increase our memory retention. The problem is when we do semantic encoding, we do have a tendency to make mistakes. We're more likely to make substitutions because when we encode semantically, we might use synonyms or similar words to encode instead of the exact term. So instead of remembering that this is effortful processing, you might remember that it is demanding processing or arduous processing, another word that is similar to effortful, and that is how you might remember what effortful processing is. So synonyms are something that happen when we use semantic encoding. We also encode by what things mean to us, and that is referred to the self-reference effect. You remember things more when you remember how it relates to yourself and your own life. You remember people you've interacted more than with people who your friends or family have interacted with. It doesn't mean as much to us, and so we might not put in the effort to remember that information, who those people are, or whatever it may be. So the more that we can take what we're learning in psychology and bring it back to our own lives and think about what it means for us on a daily basis, the more likely we're actually going to be able to remember how this vocabulary is used and what this vocabulary means. So self-reference effect is going to be a big part of our memory in psychology class. The second way that we can encode is by visualizing, and this includes using imagery. The idea here is that oftentimes we will remember things better when we can picture it. You can close your eyes and envision something. It's a lot easier to, to remember than something that is not picturable. So if you think about different words you might remember, you may remember the words like cigarette or typewriter better than words like void or process, because those words we can't picture the same way we can picture a typewriter. So adding both the language and the imagery seems to increase our overall memory retention. Other ways we can use this to help ourselves out is through things like flashbulb memories, and this is where we take mental snapshots of our best and worst moments of our lives. We really actually don't have to put a lot of effort into doing this. This is something that does happen fairly automatically. If you ask someone where they were, say on 9-11, or maybe a grandparent where they were when Kennedy was shot, 
chances are they're going to be able to remember many specific details because that is a flashbulb memory in their life. We can also remember by visualizing by using mnemonics or mnemonic devices. And these are memory aids where we essentially turn information into a picture you'll be more likely to remember. So by thinking about the hippocampus as the part of the brain responsible for memories, if you close your eyes and imagine a hippo walking around York High School, you'll remember that hippos have a good memory on campus. That is a mnemonic device that we'll actually be using in this unit to help us remember that the hippocampus is the brain part responsible for our memories. There are other visual techniques that we'll also be using in class, such as the method of Loki and the pegword method. And these are different ways that we can imagine items, topics, people in different locations, either around our house or around the school, that help us to remember certain items, particularly if we want to remember them in a specific order. And the final way that we encode is by mentally organizing. This is how we can put information into both our short-term and our long-term memory and have more information in there. The first way that we do that is through one of Ms. Turnbull's least favorite vocab terms, and that is chunking. And what chunking is, is it's taking information and putting it into units. So instead of having to remember, say, nine numbers in a row, what you can do is instead break them into smaller units, and that will help you increase the amount of information you can put into your short-term memory at any point in time. If you've ever met someone who's tried to remember many digits of pi, for example, this is something they might do by grouping together the numbers and then building upon each set to increase the amount that they can remember at a given point in time. So chunking increases the amount of information your short-term memory can hold, and it can also help us organize information in our mind to make it easier to pull from our long-term memory. We can use things like acronyms, um, things like how we remember the order of events in math equations. The please excuse my dear Aunt Sally tells us the order in which we execute different functions in math class. And my very excellent mother just served us nine pizzas helps us remember the order of all of the planets in the solar system. We can also organize by using hierarchies, so we can group things together under larger umbrellas. All of this is just organizational techniques, but it helps us to think deeply about the information we're presented with. It can help us increase the amount of information that our memory can hold. We'll go ahead and stop there for today, and next time we'll start moving into other ways that we encode automatically, as well as some tricks and phenomenon that are associated with memory retention as well. I hope this is useful as we get into this memory unit where you can see how memory techniques can be applied both in the subject of psychology and in your other classes as well. This will help when you're trying to study for exams or give a presentation or just remember the names of people that you meet. Being able to use these memory techniques is something that we can apply to a variety of areas of our life. And hopefully by learning about it this early in the year, you can use it throughout the course of the rest of the semester. Thanks for watching, and remember, be kind to your mind.